Come on, can we give some honor where honor is due? Can we give some, some claps, some shouts, some celebrations for our moms? Come on, don't stop. Tell them you love them. I'm telling you right now, I am so thankful for, for my mom. I'll start there. Um, my mom's not here today in service because she's celebrating with her mom at her church service. And I'm sure there's a lot of uh, families that are doing that today. But I honor my mom. She was a praying mom. Come on, anybody have a praying mama? Praying you through, getting you where you need to go. And I just honor uh, my wife. She is a praying mom. And I couldn't ask for a better a woman to... To love me, but love our children. And she loves the Lord. And she seeks the Lord daily. And she pours her heart into it. And I know there's some moms out here that you pour your heart into your family. You pour your heart out to the Lord. Man, you, you, you serve when nobody's looking. You lay down your life. You sacrifice a lot. Mom! <laughs> I mean, I, I get the easy one. Still to this day, Harper will be like, Mom, one in the morning. And she looks, and, and, I, and I go, <sighs> and, my, and Mom's like, I, I got it. Moms are awesome. Can we give it up for our moms one more time? I don't want to go too long in this moment, but I would like to encourage you. If you can, thank God for your mom today. I encourage you to, if you can, reach out to your mom today. If you can't write a thought to God on paper that says, thank God for my mom. Serve him well, meaning God, and serve your mom well and bless her. Obey her. And I would, as I was praying for moms, for those of you who your moms are not around any longer, or you have that relationship that's distant, I would like you to find a few things that you could advance her legacy by saying, I honor her. She instilled this within me. And I'm gonna pass it on to my neighbor, to my family, to my children, in Jesus' name. Amen, Amen. do you receive that today? Let's honor our moms. We love you, we love you moms, we love you. Well, listen, today is a good one. We're in the middle of In the Middle. <laughs> We're in a new series called In the Middle. It's week two. And I want to ask, does anyone recently, has anyone recently been to a graduation ceremony? Wave at me, wave at me. Graduation. Or do you have one coming up? You know, some friends, family, some graduates. We need to honor graduates. We will be honoring graduates upcoming that first Sunday in June. But congratulations, graduates over here. Anybody else? graduating college something let me know wave high school right here okay we honor you okay thank you for great but listen if you've been to a graduation in your life you know it's a time to honor the the great accomplishments to celebrate right your family comes together i remember my graduation ceremony friends and family come together to cheer on their loved one and, and before the uh, faculty begin to calling out students especially in those college graduation ceremonies those packed out graduation ceremonies they give instruction and it usually goes like this out of respect for all of our graduates please hold your applause until everyone has been called out thank you yeah, right. That's what I like to say, because what should be a one and a half hour event turns into a four hour display of people absolutely losing their mind as if their child just won the SEC championship. Come on, somebody. Like when my child, she's 13, when, and then Harper, nine, when she graduates, when they graduate and they say, just hold your applause until the very end, I'm going to be like, no way, cowbell, bullhorn, I'm going to be like waving. They're like, you've embarrassed me. I'm like, yes, I want to make you curl up and die one last time on platform. It's going to be awesome. And everybody tries to outdo one another. But it got me thinking, okay, you're like, why is he talking about this? Because graduation is such a huge transition in life. And thinking back, one of the things that accompanies a graduation is freakouts. Uh, students freaking out because they finally made it. 
who was like, I don't know if I'm going to make it. You finally made it. Parents freaking out in pride and also going, they're so close to moving out of the house. They made it, you know. And then you've got graduates themselves. They start to freak out because by the time you get to the after party where your mom and dad throw you the party and all the family gather around, people start asking you, so now that you've graduated, what are you going to do with your life? And you're like, sleep? I don't know. Like, like live? I mean, I don't know. And then, and, and then what I've learned is, come to find out, people, people would say stuff like, well, you'll have until the end of summer to figure it out. Well, I'm going to tell you, 20 something years later, and I'm still figuring out who's with me. You haven't quite figured out what you want to do with your life yet. I'm joking. But it comes to find out you don't have to figure it out immediately, right? It's so fun. Freak outs, freak out moments. Freak outs come in all kinds of shapes and sizes because transitions in life come in all shapes and sizes. And, and these moments can be caused by fear, worries, anxieties, pride. How many of you have had a, come on, wave at me, you've had a freak out moment recently? Just wave at me. I appreciate your honesty, Mom, right over here. I see you, Mama. Who else over here? Thank you, Mom. Anybody? No guys are at me. They're like, not today. And so it's, we're here. I'm not raising my hand. No, I mean, you, the, kind of, the kind of freak out moments where you're in a transition and you're asking yourself, what do you do when you aren't where you were or where you want to be? And now and because of life transitions, you can be right in the middle. It can be so tough that it's the kind of transition that can bring a true and total meltdown. Those unexpected events. I remember my heart was about to freak out whenever I, uh, I, I got on one knee and I asked this amazing woman to marry me. And now I did not want her to have any answer except one which was yes emphatically I did not want to have the experience of one of a, of a friend that I knew where they asked the person and it's like at the mall and they gather all the people and she's like I, I really do love you but I'm gonna think about it you're like you you're gonna freak out in that moment but my wife said yes to me and I freaked out I was like oh my goodness yes unexpected life event she goes to the doctor you're gonna be a mom you hear that whoa freak out moment she sits me down you're gonna be a dad what freak out moments what about the unexpected moments that become so overwhelming the one that's a tragic phone call or that I hate to tell you this but the doctor's on the other end of the phone and says I've got bad news it's gonna be a long journey uh, there's going to be some heartache and some pain in this journey. And so what I'm talking about is these transitions come in all shapes and sizes, and we can find ourselves in the middle of life. And so through this series, we're looking at the place in the Bible where the children of Israel, they find themselves on the way to the promised land. And we looked at this last week, but this picture will be up here. And this is where the children of Israel were held in Egypt as slaves for some 400 years, some 10 to 11 generations. And then they cross the Red Sea and they want to go to the promised land because God ha has commissioned Moses to say, let my people go. They're freed up from slavery and bondage and all of that. Cross the Red Sea and then right here they get in the middle. Someone say in the middle. In the middle. And so now they're in process and they're experiencing great fear and great frustrations. And just like last week, we saw how God's people were in the middle of the desert seasons of their life and a 14 day journey turned into a 40 year journey because they, they, the desert can be a fertile ground for complaining or for trusting God. Right? You remember, you can go back and, and listen to that. So while the children of Israel are in the middle of a desert, Come on, moms. These kids are fussing. They are fussing and they are whining and they're complaining. And then Moses is struggling to be a good leader and he doesn't know how to get all of these hundreds of thousands of people across the desert. And so remember the children of Israel, they've just been rescued from slavery and now they're complaining about the DoorDash menu. They're like, God, I don't like this 
manna. And remember we talked about manna. We don't want to eat manna. We don't want 24 hours a day, seven days a week manna. God, we know you just rescued us from our enemy, but we don't like your menu, <laughs> manna. And so they're whining and complaining and grumbling and then, and then and they're failing to see that God is absolutely sustaining them in the middle. In Numbers chapter 11, verse 10, we'll pick up here today. Moses heard all the families standing in the doorways of their tents whining. And the Lord, wow, bold right here, Old Testament. <laughs> I love it. The Lord became very, uh, extremely angry. And Moses was also very aggravated. As some translations say Moses was very troubled. So you see the people are fussy. God is furious and Moses is freaking out in the middle of the desert. I mean, you may have been there like where you've had that thought, God, can anything good come from this situation here? Can, have you ever been there? God, can anything good? It looks absolutely impossible. Imagine, I don't, have you ever been lost on a road trip? Wave at me. I cannot imagine being lost in the middle of the desert. Yesterday we went to Fort Morgan Road to go to the beach and I almost got lost because the boardwalk that we normally use, the gate was closed. It had a big old sign that said trail with an arrow and I'm standing there like, what do we do? And then the guy had to, we waited, and the guy's walking back and he's walking, I go, oh, there's the trail. I'm like, what do we do? And he's like, that's closed. You gotta go down this trail. I'm like, the trail from whence you just came? And he's like, yes, this trail. And I'm like, good, because if you not pointed it out, I know the beach is only 100 yards that way. I could have crossed a dune, who shoved a blue heron out of my way, but I didn't do it. I didn't do it. I'm like, I know the trail. No, the boardwalk. I know what's common in my life. We get lost. Can you imagine being lost and stranded and now you're eating manna that God's providing every day? He's leading you through the desert with a cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. And yet Moses is so ready to be done. He's saying, God, I'm done. I can't. I can't even these people. And right there, Moses does something that's essential to do when we're in the middle. I, I hope this encourages you moms. I hope this encourages you dads, everyone in the room. You wanna know what he does right there in the middle? Thank God he prays. He prays a sincere, honest, understandable prayer, but do you wanna know what he prays? It's hilarious. Look at Numbers 11, 11 through 15. Moms, I know you'll relate. And Moses said to the Lord, why are you treating me, your servant, so harshly? Have mercy on me. What did I do to deserve the burden of all these people? Did I give birth to them? Uh, did I bring them into the, like, Moses, you are pulling the wrong card here, buddy. He's like, did I give birth to them, God? Did I bring them into the world? Oh my gosh, can you hear his voice? Why did you tell me to carry them in my arms like a mother carries a nursing baby? How can I carry them to the land you swore to give their ancestors? Where am I supposed to get meat for all these people? They keep whining to me. And now he's whining to God saying, he's saying, they're whining to me, God. It's like he's acting it out. They're whining to me. Give us meat to eat. It's hilarious. Can you see it? He's freaking out. I can't carry all these people by myself. Now he starts preaching like a Pentecostal preacher. The load is far too heavy. Ha! God, I need help. Ha! If this is how you intend to treat me, just go ahead and kill me. Ha! Whoa, bro. That's the wrong time to say amen. Do me a favor and, do me a favor and spare me this misery. What a prayer. Wow. So the desert in the... So let, let's look at this. The, the, the desert is a fertile ground for complaining or trusting but clearly the transitions of life can be a place for a total meltdown and I've had these feelings before even rare outbursts yes I'm gonna to admit to you even in prayer where I have found myself in the little back corner of my lot or sitting in the parking lot called my driveway having a meltdown moment with God. 
You see, Moses, he becomes frustrated and he prays. But he prays such a troubling prayer. You see, the NIV phrase is Moses was troubled. Yes, he was aggravated, but he was troubled to the depth of his spirit, meaning, and it's translated, and in the eyes of Moses, in the eyes of this person, he believes what he is going through is evil and is bad, and he's troubled because he's not the one that asked for it. God asked him to do it, and I'm troubled not only in this journey, I'm troubled at God. You know the feeling. God, I don't know. God, I know you're... I'm just going to say one of my prayers before. God, I don't know what to do. You asked me to do this. You asked me to step into this. You gave me this child. And God, I don't know what to do in this moment. And I feel that you're frustrated at me because I can't do what you're asking me to do. I don't know how to do what you're asking me to do. And I'm frustrated because it's impossible to do what you've asked me to do. God, I don't know what to do in this moment, how to live this life, how to live this Christian life. I, I want to, God, I but I don't know with this event, this circumstance that you've brought me to. God, you did this. <laughs> Have you ever prayed that prayer? Just be honest with me and tell me I'm not alone on this platform. God, what do I do? What do I do? And God, I, don't, I want you to be happy, but I don't know that you are. God, I've got regrets. And I love that the Bible is so raw with our humanity that he highlights the humanity of a hero like Moses. Hebrews, you can go read in the book of Hebrews about the, the hall of faith or the hall of fame faith and Moses lands on those pages. He's a hero of faith. But are you kidding me? Did you just read his prayer? Could you imagine me as a pastor coming in here and say, let's just open up with prayer today. God, all of these people that you've given me, you did this. Could you imagine you're like, oh, bro, I don't know if I like that prayer. But yet we've prayed that way over our family and over our children and over our life. Let's be honest. God, why are you treating me so harshly? What did I do to deserve this? Yep. Some of us can relate. I know some moms can relate. I've said this before. Why is it so hard? Why does it never stop? Work never stops. Me and my wife, we look at each other. It's 9.30, 9.45, 10, 10.30 at night. We barely catch the news. We got the kids to bed. We work. We pay bills. Excuse me. She prepared breakfast. <laughs> Sorry. I was about to get a little bit too much credit here. I get in trouble. She, she, the endless list of breakfast, lunch, dinner, schooling, homeschooling, paying the bills, laundry, co-pays. Chase down that co-pay. They charged me $15 too much. And then she gets it returned. We got sports we've got schedules train up a child in the way they should go love the lord your god get here moms mom mom i need i need i need she's like i need i need no i need i need i need my wife is very patient she's not she's not off the chain like that but i promise you we have moments we're human we have moments and so we look at each other and we go why are we so tired you're so tired and then she asks me questions like do, do I look tired? No. 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 <laughs> Perhaps you feel, no, you are going, hey, let's go over here for a second. So anyway, uh, so, so the, the reality is this, can, can, but you, come on, you talk in your house, can things get any worse financially? She asks you a question like that, what do you do as a dad? You go outside, dear God, can anything get worse financially? The way to the world, I feel like I'm carrying some things. Let's get there. See, some of your spouses and your marriage, your, 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 excuse me, your, the spouse within the relationship, maybe the relationship is drifting further and further away, and you're going, God, what do I do? What do I do? It doesn't seem right. And so there's two key words in this prayer of Moses that actually have some powerful meaning. And they actually share the, the same root meaning. The first word is the word burden, not a positive word, but it's in verse 11. He asked God, what have I done to displease you? I think there's a lot of Christians and people in this world who have that view of God. God, why are you displeased with me? But God, you displeased me so much that you put the burden 
of all these people on me. Burden, burden, burden. And then the second word is carry. Verse 12, he asked, why did you tell me to carry them in my arms? And Moses' meltdown looks like yours and I and probably rooted in the same thing. He feels the need to carry something that he was never asked to carry. God asked him to care for, but did not ask to carry. Moses states, I can a truth bomb right here in a prayer. I cannot carry. Why don't you do this as a prayer today, moms? Come on, some of you need to get freed up in this service and you didn't even know it. And it's a powerful prayer. He spoke it right here. Just lift your hands and be like, God, I cannot carry. I cannot carry some of the things that I'm carrying. I cannot carry all these people by myself. The burden is too heavy for me. And see, these words unlock so much truth because elsewhere in the Old Testament, uh, it speaks that the Almighty God is the one who carries his children, his people. That it's God that was never expecting Moses to carry all of these people. That he was never meant to shoulder the weight of all of these people's uh, slavery mentality now that they're rescued and in the middle. He wasn't asked to carry their sin, their shame, their burden. He was asked to lead and guide and care and comfort, but not carry. And I love that God spoke to Moses right in the middle of his journey and right in the middle of his painful prayer. Exodus chapter 19, verse 4, God speaks to Moses. At Mount Sinai, God said to his people, I love this. You yourselves have seen what I did in Egypt and how I carried you on eagles' wings and I brought you to myself. Some of you need to receive that today. Man, later Moses will boldly remind the Israel, the ones that he just complained about and prayed, I can't carry. He later boldly declares to the children of Israel this in Deuteronomy chapter 1 verse 30. The Lord your God who is going before you will fight for you as he did for you in Egypt before your very eyes and in the wilderness. There you saw how the Lord your God carried you as a father carries his son. Why has it got to be a father? I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. As a father carries his son all the way you went until you reached this place. What am I saying? It is your heavenly father who carried you out of the wilderness, out of darkness, out of sin, out of slavery, out of bondage, come on, out of addiction, out of shame, out of guilt, out of condemnation. And he carries you like a good heavenly father, scoops you up in his arms and carries you. He said, you're my people and I need to carry you all the way to this place where you can be in my presence every day, even in the middle, even when you haven't reached the promised land yet. I'm the one who carried you. I'm the one who raises you up on eagle's wings. I'm the one that lets you see my ways are higher than your ways. My thoughts are higher. I'm the one who carries you. I fight for you. And let me tell you, all he does is win. Win. It's amazing. Come on, church. I remind you that you have a God who goes before you. He loved you so much that he sent Jesus to carry the burden, to carry the shame, to carry your weakness. He calls you out of wandering and out of wondering. And I said that correctly. For those of you who are seeking God and seeking faith and seeking Jesus, he calls you out of wandering and wondering if he's good. He's a good father who carries his children. So let me ask you a very powerful question. Why are you carrying so much? Let me ask you this one today. What are you carrying? What are you carrying? You can only carry so much. I've learned in life carrying something light, even for a long time, gets real heavy. 
There's things that we need to set down at the feet of Jesus and say, God, I, I meant to care for this people. I meant to care for this, but I'm not meant to carry. See, carrying people as if you were their savior will only crush you. But Jesus was crushed and beaten and bruised for a purpose to show you that he's the only one that can be your savior. I remind myself daily, Amy and I talk to each other and go, I'm a terrible savior. Amy's not a, a great savior. There's only one who can save, and his name is Jesus. Can we give him praise? I love Jesus, and I love this because God showed in the Old Testament, and he proved it time and time again over his people. You were never meant to carry what you're carrying alone. You were never meant to carry it alone. It reminds me of the old saying about even great leaders. Great leaders like Moses, a hero of the faith. Just because someone carries it well doesn't mean it ain't heavy. Right. It's still heavy. Life can get heavy. No mistake about it. But it's not meant to be burdensome. Because we were never created or designed to do life alone. Single mom, you're not called to do life alone and you don't have to. Mom, you don't have to do life alone. Father, you don't have to do life alone. Single person, you don't have to do life alone. You're not meant to carry it alone. And you have one who came alongside you to carry with you. And we learn from Moses as he approaches God with brutal honesty. One, make a bullet point there. It's not even on the screen. Get really brutally honest with God. Go before him and ask God what you need to do. But even in your brutal honesty, you don't have to accuse God. You don't have to blame God. You especially do not need to curse him, but you can admit how you feel. You would think that God met Moses with more fury in this prayer, but instead, I love how God responds so beautifully. He comes alongside Moses to show him to help him. In Numbers chapter 11, verse 16 through 17, the Lord said to Moses, Check this out. Gather before me 70 men who are recognized as leaders and, and leaders, as, as elders and leaders of Israel. Bring them to the tabernacle to stand there with you. I will come down and talk to you there. I will take some of the spirit that is upon you and I will put the spirit upon them also. They will bear the burden of the people along with you so you will not have to carry it alone. Did you catch what just happened? God responds to Moses and shows us you were never meant to carry it alone, but also that God's provision is often found right in the middle of the problem. Did you catch the solution to the problem, by the way? It was the very thing that Moses thought was the problem. And it was what? People. <laughs> People, just look around. Look around right now. Look around. Look around. Look around the whole room. Seriously, look, look around the room. Look around the room. Look around the room. Some of you came in here with problems, and I'm here to free you up today. Some of the solution to your problem isn't just your alone time with God. Some of the solution to your problem is right here. The church, the body of Christ, a small group, a, a prayer warrior, someone who can to walk alongside with you when you're in the moments of life and you need someone to help. Can I get an amen? amen. See, Moses tried to blame the people, blame the people, and he said, newsflash, Moses, my provision and my promise, my promise is no promise at all without the promise of my people. And I need you to lead people to the promise. I need you to lead sons and daughters and next generations to the promise. Come on, mom, I need you to pray. And even when you get furious and frustrated, lead your home to the promise. Come on, dad, I need you to, to I know you're frustrated, I know it's fussy, I know it's crazy, but even in the middle of this culture, I want you to carry promise Amen. people to the promise. Amen. 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 See, God's provision is not another huge miracle sometimes. It's not another huge miracle or a massive display of his power. Rather, God simply points Moses to the people that God had already provided. I love how in Exodus chapter 18, verse 25, Moses gets instruction from his father-in-law. Thank you, Dan. Uh, Moses gets instruction from Jethro in the Bible. And Jethro says, hey, 
I want to remind you of a word that God gave you. Choose capable men from all of Israel. Leaders. And lead the people. Officials that can lead over thousands of people. Hundreds of people. Fifties of people. And tens. The reason why I bring that up today is again to show you that God always has a solution even in the middle of your meltdown, even in the middle of pain. God has a provision for you. What am I saying? I'm saying today, God's always available. He just wants you to come to him and ask, ask, ask. Ask. God's special provision is often found in the problem we've received and we can try to blame family, we can try to blame people, we can try to blame the nation, we can try to blame inflation. But if you're not careful, you will never see the solution because you won't ask for help. I would say today, take a lesson from Moses and ask for help. But pastor, it is hard to ask for help. How hard is it to ask for help? It's hard. It's hard to make that call. You know the reason why a lot of people don't make the call and ask for help? It's this phenomenon that happens in, the, in humanity. I actually read an article this week about people who are going through addiction recovery. They call it, this phenomenon, they call it the thousand pound phone. And because they know they need help and they know that help is close by, but, but I don't know if I can call mom and dad and, and get help. I don't know if I can ask God for help. I've already been around this mountain. It, it's a lot for me. And I know I need help. And I know I need a church. And I know I need a leader. But I know I need a pastor. But I don't know. I know I need to call the right person. But it's a thou. It, it, to pick up that phone means I'm going to have to humble myself and pick up the phone and call someone who cares. I'm reminding you that his name is God, yes, but it could be someone else even in this building called the church. Can I get an amen? amen. See, they would go on to say picking up the phone is such a difficult task and a call. It's so heavy because it's become so easy to go at life alone. I'm super independent. I've been let down so many times. I've got so much disappointment and abandonment. I know I should call my son. I know I should call my daughter, but they're the one that walked away. Or the kids going, I know I should call my mom and dad, but they're the one that walked away. I wish I could, but they're not here. And God, it's heavy, and I've been disappointed, and I was disappointed at the last church, and I was disappointed here, and I was disappointed there. And God said, I know, and it feels like a thousand pound phone. But you know what? They come to this place that that's an illusion. This person who was going through recovery said, I've recognized that my home was built by others. I did not build it. It's strong and sturdy and beautiful, and all of life's luxuries come from the efforts of others. My life is good and wonderful, and that speaks to the universal good, that God is universally good and has common grace on your life, whether you're good or not. My life is good and wonderful because of the contributions of many others, and it's easy to allow this anonymous dependency, this intimate dependency where I must be real and vulnerable. It's so challenging. But with practice, my phone has gone on a diet. It no longer weighs a 1,000 pounds. I feel so good. When I call, I feel so light. I'm getting lighter. I recognize I'm not bothering them. And I feel good when we support each other. In this moment, I'd encourage you lastly, one, go to God in the middle of your freak out moment. Two, I would say this. I have learned, what did Moses say? He said, uh, God said, you will see you will see what I've done right before your eyes. You will see. Lord, I ask that people in this room would see what you've already done for them right before their eyes. I would, I've heard the term called God winks. Have you ever heard that? God winks. I don't want to make it awkward, but maybe you could look down the aisle and just wink at somebody. That would be a little fun. Lighten the mood a little bit. But God winks at you. God smiles at you. God loves you. And he's winked at your life so many times. And what's a God wink? A God wink is not necessarily another Red Sea moment. 
It's not another pillar of fire and a cloud by day. It's not, it's a God wink is one of those things where he could have provided a bigger solution. He was absolutely able, but instead of providing the solution the way I wanted it at a Red Sea moment, he solved it in a much smaller, less uh, magnificent way. You know what I'm talking about? But it's still a, a million, million, million little miracles that add up and you're like, wow, a couple of God winks that I've had in my life was a moment when I had a stomach ulcer sir. My parents were crying out to God saying, God, my son has lost over half of his blood. He, he's on, he's not doing well. He is, he needs a miracle. And the blood bank was dry. No blood in the, in the no, no blood in the bag at the hospital. And they're praying for a miracle. And I was like, God, I need to get up off of this bed. But I laid there for two days. And then Mr. Bill Robinson out of the church, came to the church another person came and God winked on my life and he gave blood and his blood is O negative and mine's O negative and it's hard to find and so now every time I get the email or text that says they're giving a $20 e-gift card to Life South Blood Mobile I don't care about the $20 e-gift card I try to go four or five times a year and give blood so that maybe someone else gets a God wink in their life. That they can live and not die. That they can be called out of darkness. You know what I'm saying? But it's practical miracles that God shows us through the church. The church and his people. And God will wink on you time and time again. Wave at me if you've had a God wink in your life. Come on. And we said, oh, that was a small thing. No, that was a big thing. Bow your head and close your eyes. God's reminding some moms and some people in here today, you can trust me. I'm for you. I'm with you in the middle. I've got you. You're not alone. You do belong to me. So often we look for the thing that brings us out of transition and out of the middle when we need to look for what we need to look for is the things that brings us through the transition God is winking and smiling on your life and I'm just asking right now the Holy Spirit any every every ear under the sound of my voice that God would just begin to remind you of the God winks that he's had in your life and that you would write them down and remember the victories that God has had over your life remember them remember them remember them now I'm going to challenge you to share them with someone so this week, pay attention to those reminders. Even when you're prone to freak out, open your eyes. Well, why don't you raise your hands right now if you say, God, I want my eyes to be open, my ears to be open. I want to see how good you've been on my life. God, forgive me if I've forgotten how good you've been on my life. God, I'm catching up to the fact that you are universally good and you've got great common grace, but God, I want to know your supernatural grace. If that's you, I'm letting you know today, there's only one who can carry you out of the wilderness. There's only one who can carry you into the promised future that he has for your life. And his name is Jesus Christ. He loves you. He died on the cross for you. He lived a perfect, sinless, blameless life and carried your sin, shame, and burden. If you want to bow your life to Jesus today as the Lord and Savior of your life, shoot your hand up right now and say, I want to receive Jesus. I see your hand. Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. Yes, hands. I see you. Yes, ma'am. Right there. Boldness. Just wave it at me. I, I see you. Yes, ma'am. Anyone else? Yes, sir. Right here. I see you in this section. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. I see you. Come on. God's moving. Yes. Anybody else? All right. Let's say this prayer together. Say, Jesus, thank you for saving me. Jesus, I believe you carried me to the cross and you overcame death, hell, and the grave. Jesus, thank you for fighting for me. And thank you for winning. Jesus, I receive your spirit, your grace, your life right now. Jesus, I will follow you all the days of my life. In Jesus' name, amen.